Good morning. It's morning here anyway. Uh, so we've been building a streaming music service using Phoenix and Elixir. And um, I apologize, this is my second try at this video. Um, so if I'm a little mixed up about what we've done and what we haven't done, uh, that's why. Um, I ran into a little trouble. I had um, used Homebrew to install well, all kinds of stuff, um, but certainly Elixir and Erlang and, and Postgres. And I ran into some trouble or difficulty with it is I had installed a new program and I'm, I'm sure I didn't run brew upgrade, but somewhere along the line, uh, somehow it, it thought it was going to do me a favor and install the latest version of Erlang and the OTP and um, Elixir as well. And that, I don't think it was maybe not the latest version of Elixir, but a newer version um, than what I wanted to have. And... Uh, yeah, that caused all kinds of trouble when I was trying to do some of what we'll hopefully get to in this video. And um, I got it all entangled last night, but um, here we are today. And so I, I just bounced back. Um, we'll go ahead and go through this video again. I didn't want to leave you hanging or give you a video about tr troubleshooting homebrew. Like, that's not what we're doing here. So anyways, I think... I think I have uh, Homebrew set up now to use a specific version of the OTP um, that matches what I have on my server. Um, and then um, for Elixir, they didn't have separate formulas for different, like, mm, not major, but, you know, minor versions, like 110 is what I have. Um, so that was a little more fiddly. I had to um, check out an older version of the formula fix it up because there's been some changes, apparently breaking changes to how you write formulas since then. Um, fix that up, run it um, to build that version of Elixir, uh, and then pin that version, uh, which is something I didn't know you could do until yesterday. So that was um, a good thing to learn about. There's, um, I don't know if I have anything else in Homebrew right now that I want pinned, but because um, the like Postgres and Erlang, I can set like the major version I want. So and I think we've got Postgres at 12, maybe, and Erlang at 21. And I know those are a little older, and you know it's what I've got on the server. I do upgrade the server from time to time, but um, you know I don't don't feel like I got to be the first person to install a new version of something. I don't like to get too far behind, but. Mostly I'll upgrade when there's something I need or want, um, and that'll make it worth the time to sit down and read through all, because, you know, I actually like read through the release notes and do some testing and like you're supposed to, but <clears throat> if you upgrade everything the day it comes out, like you're just hitting the update button because you'd go bonkers trying to like actually upgrade everything the right way. You just spend all your time on that, I think. Um, so. Yeah, that way I get to skip some versions and um, consolidate some of the changes and things I need to update or, or be cognizant of. So, And it just seems like if you do all of that all at once, you get into a rhythm with it and it goes quicker. And I don't know, that's my take on it. But uh, I know other folks like to, to have the latest and greatest. And, and there's upsides to that, too. You get to use all the, the cool new stuff right when it comes out and um, really be plugged into the... Um, ecosystems that you engage with. So anyways, that's how I do it. And um, that's what bit me. So uh, yeah, so what were we doing is we were, um, we had just fixed up the player on mobile, right? And um, just started to do some styling for mobile. And uh, that seems like it'd be a good thing to continue. Let's see if I can get the simulator up. Uh, I think I can just do like that. Sure can't. Um, There it comes. Um, 
And then once that's up, um, we'll connect the um, debugger to it, the um, developer tools, you know, in Safari. So um, over here, yeah, you can see kind of <laughs> yeah, preview. Um, Phoenix server, we'll get that up and going. Oh. So, oh, okay, I gotta fire up Postgres. Right, I rebooted the computer. Speaking of updates, I had some software updates to do. And I restarted my computer. I know I could set this up to start with the computer, but I don't. There we go. Okay, so that's up and going. Let's reload. Okay, so that's what it looks like now, which, you know, actually works. It's just tiny, you know. Um, but we can do better. So, yeah, I see uh, some other stuff. <laughs> You're not ready for that yet. Uh, is there a, where have I moved to trash? Okay. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, so we want to look at the player and we want to get the uh, developer tools connected. Uh, that's the one. Cool. All right, so that's pretty handy. Um, now, Something I lost in bouncing back to an earlier commit is I know we had in the last video started to do like the media query and stuff. Or the media, the app media like this. So won't uh, dwell on that too much this time. I think I had something like um, max width um, 40M. Does that sound right? And then we had made all of these sections um, uh, unpositioned and um, what we had to get rid of the padding on them, right? Because we had padding. That did less than I expected. Um, Did something wrong with this, didn't I? What? Did I get the syntax wrong? Um, the, um, What uh, what am I missing here? I'm missing something important. Um, what do we get over here? Um, oh, huh. so we already talked about the um, meta, 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 meta viewport. Man, I don't know what I'd do without the internet. I'd have to write down a lot more things, you know what? Uh, content, and I think we figured out that we only need the initial scale in here, and we're not going to mess around with the notch, right? I think we talked about all that. Okay. There we go. Now it's all busted good. All right. So let's get into that. Oh yeah, we talked, oh, Z index, we left out. So I had thought 
maybe the um, background appearing above the, you know, the, the stuff that's a regular part of the, the flow is got to do with it making a new stacking context. It does make a new stacking context, but that's not the issue. Um, the issue is just simply like the way that stacking works. And so um, the, the unpositioned content, so that includes now the header, um, gets stacked within its own Z layer, so Z, Z index zero. Within Z index zero, see the, the Z index doesn't tell like exactly how things stack up, it's like whole layers, and within the layer things stack according to the normal rules. And the normal rule is like the unpositioned stuff stacks in the order it appears in the document, um, or if you're using like Flexbox, the order that you set on it, um, and then positioned stuff stacks on top of that, like it starts stacking on top of that. So if we set the Z index, um, that will um, com compel that thing to stack in a different layer along with anything else that's put in that layer according to the rules. So the background, we really had ought to have put background image in the background. So really we ought to be setting the Z index here and make it always be below um, Z index zero, the, the default stuff that's getting stacked um, where, wherever. Now I wanna put a note here um, because on desktop this Z index isn't strictly necessary because we put the background image element first and everything's positioned. So normally it would come at the bottom of the stack up without the Z image, uh, or Z index, sorry. Um, um, setting the Z index. Yeah, so that's, that'll hopefully keep me out of trouble later when I'm like, but you don't need this, and take it out and see it works fine. <laughs> but don't check it on mobile. You ever done that kind of thing? Yeah, so that should keep me out of trouble there. Um, oh, and so the other thing we need to do is um, set the width back to auto. Okay, so that's um, the text aligns right on the header, so that's why that goes over to the right, and that's fine. Um, let's get the message to where it goes. Um, now, as you can see, like this is this is one of the downsides of using a monospace um, font is on mobile, it's not very space efficient for its readability. I think that's going to be fine. Um, oh, pardon me. Uh, boop. I think that's going to be fine in this case, but um, it's a trade-off, you know, like we're getting the aesthetic I want and um, having that grid of characters helps align some things and make them look nice. Um, but there is a trade-off to it and that's in this case information density. Um, and I know the style right now is not to have high information density, but I'm not convinced by that in a lot of applications. In some it makes sense, um, but to just have it as a principle without considering the application I'm not sold on. Um, but we'll see how that all plays out, see who's right. But um, I, I would prefer to have things where I need them. Now it depends, you know, because like if something's 
really not likely to be used. Moving it off the screen could help, especially in an application where um, you're only going to use it once, you know, like a, some, some websites are like that. Like each user is really only going to come by one or two times or very rarely, you know, a couple times a year or whatever. Um, but if it's something that somebody's going to use all the time, um, you know, I think that they'll find it worthwhile to, um, learn it a little bit. And in that case, the higher information density can make it so you don't have to bounce around between a lot of places, even in cases where somebody's only going to use it once. If it's something they're going to need, reducing the number of taps or clicks and the latency with each of those and the like sense of spatial confusion you can get from going here and there and everywhere, that can be beneficial too, I think. But anyway, that's what I think. Um, I think it's called audio. Yep, and um, we'll come back to that. Okay, so there's a couple of things. One is the spacing between the sections. You can see we have spacing between the paragraphs here. And this up here is adequate, like for whatever reason. Let's see what the reason is. Um, excuse me. Uh, it just has to do with like the line height on that header. See, they bounce right together, but the line heights actually kind of provide adequate spacing there. We could tighten up this spacing on mobile um, and maybe that's something to look at. Right now we're just trying to get this to be like adequate, not awesome. Um, I, I think either or both of will improve this in the future to make it a really first class experience on mobile um, and or we'll make a mobile app, right? And so that's, but this is just, I got one listener I know of for sure. Um, who will probably want to listen on mobile, and I'm thinking of them with this. Um, mostly, I think the folks who are trying this out for me are working on desktop, and my sense is that that may be my overall audience, but, you know, I'm interested to find that out. Um, you know, if you, if this is something you would use or are using and, you know, you have some knowledge to share on that, let me know down in the comments. Um, hopefully in a future video or series of videos, um, I hope to talk some about analytics and we'll build some in here because that's something I want to know is, um, you know, we've talked some about browser support and now mobile versus desktop. And I'd, I'd like to see that kind of information um, to make good decisions about what direction to take the service in. So um, we'll, hopefully we'll get into that in a, in a later series of videos. Let me know if that's something you're interested in. Um, Cause when I hear back from folks that, you know, they'd like to see something, of course that helps motivate me to, to take the time to, you know, comb my hair and get a, get the camera out and, and do up a video. So. You know, I'm not combing this hair, right? I'm pulling your leg. Isn't that a weird saying, pulling your leg? I don't even know what that means, but here we are. Okay, so that gets that there. Now, um, this one, I want the text align to be left. The, the header I kind of like over to the right. That's cool to me, but this... Um, mm, so, um, for narrower viewports, basic optimizations for narrower viewports. So this is, um, um, Heard header and main sections flow rather than um, be positioned. And yeah, we'll count, we'll count that. Uh, rather than be positioned, adjust. Space 
spacing and text alignment to suit. Um, and then, so there's, um, we should do, do I remember that right? And margin top, one M. Yeah, so that um, gets us that. Now, like I said, we could tighten that spacing up a little. Um, I'm fine with it for now. Uh, so let's come back to that button. And then there's one other big thing on here I think you probably see that needs to be fixed. And that's, see, we're scrolling. So we'll come to that um, pretty quick too. So make listen button more touchable. Because um, that's, you know, like you can hit that. That's a good tap target. But we could do better. Like that's not the size that a tap target would normally be on mobile, right? So let's, um, let's make the listen button an inline block. Um, and then we can say width is 100%, I think, and that should, yep. And uh, let's, uh, no, I don't wanna set the, do I wanna set the height? We could just set the height um, to 3M. Now that's a tap target right there. And we do have a little, you know, it's a little scrolly. I'm not too offended by that. We've still got the listen button like on the front, above the fold as they say. Um, you know, and this is an iPhone SE, this is kind of, towards the small end of like what kind of screen somebody's gonna have these days, I think. Um, much to my dismay, I'm a small phone kind of guy, um, but I think I'm in the minority on that. I think most folks have a much bigger screen than this. Um, so anyways, yeah, I'm not too worried if there's a little scrolling to see everything. Um, that's why I brought things, didn't just position everything. Um, so I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, let's um, look at that. That's interesting. Is it because um, there's a hyphen in there, right? So let's um, don't scroll for long text. Links especially. Links for example. So I think that's, I think we wanna say on paragraphs, uh, overflow is hidden. Yeah, so that works, but Um, and it still wraps, um, and I, I do want to say text overflow ellipsis. Did I do that wrong? I think you can do that text overflow. Yeah. Oh, I spelled ellipsis wrong. How embarrassing. Okay, so we, we get that, but we still get the wrap. Uh, gross. Um, so here's what I don't know. Can I say that? I can, okay. Uh, now that might cause trouble later, right? Because if we added another link, like if we put a link up in the message for something that can wrap, 
um, that wouldn't be nice. So I think, I think we should restrict that, right? Is to um, the audio and background. Is that the right way to do that? Well, I think so. Um, let's just check. So, uh, audio link field. Oh, so maybe that's the right way to, let's say, audio link field and um, background link field. Is that, um, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so that works, and that I feel better about. So that's more, we don't wanna just affect every link necessarily, right? White space is pre, and I think, I think you can put white, like th that's, um, That doesn't have to be on like a block element, does it? Um, applies to all elements. Okay, cool. So yeah, I think that that gets us there. We can listen. Very cool. So yeah, I think that makes the, and that's not too much code to, to make mobile like way more cool. Um, yeah, I think I like that. I think I'm with that. And um, I think that'll work for us to, to roll this out. So let's commit that. And uh, make player cool on mobile. Did did I mention, I don't know if it was in the last video or if I'm telling you this again for the second time, but uh, I looked up that 50 character limit and as far as I can tell, like, it's just a suggestion. Like, just, just somebody said that. Maybe there's some tools that, you know, cut off after a certain number of characters, but you know, uh, this tool cuts off after a certain number of characters and it just depends how many. It's not 50, you know? Uh, I think somebody wrote a blog post once and said shoot for around 50. Yeah. And so that's where the 50 came from, but isn't that funny, the way things come around? So, uh, oh, okay. So the another thing I did in the last video is we tossed a favicon in here. And uh, let's see. So I think we're done with the simulator. Um, and link, it's like link rel icon. Something like that. No, no. Well, who's this guy? This guy seems cool, right? Ye yes, we're not gonna do sh Oh, right, that's the, what he's talking about. So it should just be icon. Um, let's get that up here. Yeah, I could do a favicon.ico, but at, like, I looked it up, and um, it's like everything we want to support supports ping favicons, and like, I'm not, we, that's fine. Like, everything we're trying to support supports them. It's kind of just a nice to have anyway, in my opinion, um, for this. And we might want to do touch icons and stuff later. Um, depending on what way we go between like making mobile first class or if we want to do an app. Um, but if we make the mobile site first class, people will probably want to bookmark it, right? Uh, which actually, in my opinion, is an argument for doing an app. But of course, an app is more work. We've already gotten really good progress on having a good mobile experience. So, um, but I think we can probably build a better one in an app. Um, But this is my opinion, 
right now, my uneducated opinion without looking into it. Um, so, here's, so something I ran into is, um, okay, so that, it, it came up, but I think that's from when I was working on it before, and, um, that's not, what I ran into with Safari is I actually had to empty the cache to get it to pull the favorite, because it had, you know, done the automatic um, request for favicon.ico at some point and gotten a, you know, like a, a 404 and had like cached that. And so even though the link was there in the document, like it didn't go look at it. It had just decided like, oh, this doesn't have a favicon. So clearing the cache has got it to load. Uh, so I might do something fancier, but that's um, good for now. And um, we should update the git ignore and get that out of there. Okay, and then favorites icon. Cool. Okay, so the favorites icon's out of the way. Now, I think the last hurdle to um, shipping this is um, a production configuration, right? So, um, and this is where I ran into trouble with having the wrong version of everything, of course. So um, let's, let's look at well, let's, before we dive into that, um, let's look at what we have for a config right now. So a couple of things that aren't gonna work for production is this. Um, in production, I wanna use an URL to configure the repo, and I wanna pass that in from um, an environment variable, like um, a system environment variable, not a Elixir environment thing, right? Um, Likewise, here on the endpoint, I don't want debug errors, I don't want the code reloader or the live reload. And um, I want it to always bind only on 127001 um, because I'll use, um, I forget if I have RelayD in front of this or if I'm just using um, Packet Filter to do NAT, but either way, um, I want this, it's, it's gonna run as a normal user process, not as root. And so it's gonna have to bind a high port. And um, so one way or another, I have to translate to it. And um, yeah, so I want it to always bind 127001 and I'll want the port to be configurable from an environment variable as well. Um, in case I should need to move it. And then I think the rest of this stuff we can leave for now. Um, and it'll probably be the case later on that maybe this changes um, or maybe this changes um, in production, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So the um, crux of this is this config file gets loaded and then after we've done everything here, we can import another config file, which will be, uh, the name of it will depend on our environment. So prod, dev, or test. Um, so then we can make uh, a new file and we can just move these things right over to it. That's interesting, huh? Um, oh, yeah, we got to import config here, I think, even so. It's not just like an include. I think we actually need that. Like, it doesn't just poke it into the file here. I think it like, loads it like a new, comp compiles it like a new script, you know? So we need that import, I believe. And then um, we'll move the endpoint configuration out there too. Now I'm trying, I think it may be the case 
that let's find out I think we might be able to do this is to config the same thing more than once and get them to merge them I think that might be some of the magic this does for us so I think we can take that out here leave it in here um, and I think that's cool, but let's check, shall we? Yeah, so that worked. Um, cool. Because uh, sometimes that's pretty handy to be able to configure some things here and some things there. So this, for a dev config, is cool. Uh, but we need to configure those same things in prod um, and it'll be different. So um, here we're going to configure it with an URL and um, we'll, we'll come back to what that looks like. In fact, let's Uh, I think it's on Ecto. So we get that documentation up and um, read below for more. So it looks like this. Um, and that's just easier. It's just, it's just one environment variable to set in the script that will run the program in production rather than a bunch. So just a little easier to deal with. And then um, the other thing we'll need, so we need to fill this variable in, right? And I think what we need is under system, wherever system is, here. Um, so we'll do like repo or all. Um, System.get end, and that's going to be like this. Um, no default, because what we're actually going to do is um, raise. If this isn't set, uh, we're, we're going nowhere without this set. And then uh, the other one we'll get is the port. And uh, so this is going to be like, um, oh, is it string dot to integer? Yeah. Integer port. Okay. And um, I also want to set the IP address here. And these options come from Plug Cowboy. So you can see here's how you set the IP up, um, the port. I don't think we need to set anything else here right now, um, but we may need to revisit that. And then of all of that, we get rid of in prod. Um, yeah, and there'll be more stuff as we go along that'll need to be set here. Um, and we'll set it when we need to. So let's say mix env equals prod. We know we need to set the repo URL. Um, what's that look like again? Is it at? So it's kind of like a HTTP thing, a local host. Uh, and this is just called lo-fi limo. We'll actually um, change this <clears throat> at some point um, on prod it's going to be well I'm trying to remember how I do that it might actually be called lo-fi limo prod in prod but it might just be lo-fi limo too so but locally I usually have a dev and test database so when we go to do tests um, we'll split that and make two different ones um, but for now, it's just lo-fi limo, and then we need to set the port. Uh, 
And we'll just see how that works here. Uh, I want to say at some point we need to set the secret key base for something, but I don't think right now we're using anything that needs it. Um, but we'll probably need that later. So cool. So that fired right up in prod. Um, so yeah, uh, this video is getting about to length. Um, I would like to, you know what I'll do uh, as far as deployment is, um, I will point you to my personal website where I have some articles about hosting a Phoenix web app on OpenBSD, which is what I run on my server. But even if you're using something else, some of this might be helpful to you. Um, the gist of it is I use Tmux and I have a script that will start a Tmux um, session, Tmux session, I think, and um, create some windows in there, windows. I forget all the terminology in Tmux, but anyway, script makes a Tmux session, sets up a window for um, Phoenix to run in. It also sets up a window um, where IEX is attached, and so you can do live debugging or inspection. Um, and it also fires up um, PSQL um, to connect to the database in case um, some inspection of the database is called for. And I think it also spins up a uh, shell in the application directory. And all of this is, uh, this, this script gets run um, at startup through cron. Um, OpenBSD cron has a time spec that's like just for like it's called like at start or something like that or at boot or something it's it's all in the article i'll put you a link to the article if i remember and if i forget um, remind me in the comments and i'll put it but um anyway so that gets going at startup and then i just make like a tiny little deploy script that's going to rsync over the the stuff that is the program um and uh then SSH to the server and um, respawn the window with the application in it, right? So, and that will cause the application to reload the new code. The, it's not a zero downtime thing. You could do zero downtime with um, Elixir and Phoenix. I don't think most people do. Um, I think it's recommended against for reasons. Um, but Elixir and Erlang in general do allow you to um, update modules on the fly and stuff. So. In some cases, you could probably do it zero downtime if you wanted to like figure out the right sequence to do and test it a little. I just do, do this when not too many people are on. Um, also, the app is designed um, to have that not really be a problem. Like it's, it's not going to be a big impact to the listener. They may just wait a little longer to get the next audio or background or something, but the front end, as you recall, is designed to continue to retry on an exponential back off. And so they should get caught up pretty quick um, without even having to reload. Um, and that's one of the reasons I like to build things like that. But not even just for um, deployment, but all kinds of things can go wrong on the internet um, to where you would you know, miss a request or something. So I think it's always nice if you can, and it makes sense to do that kind of um, retry automatically rather than expect the user, the listener to like reload something. Um, you should just try and take care of it for them if you can. So anyway, yeah, as far as deployment goes, I'll, I'll point you at this article and it even has like um, source code for an example script to start up Tmux and um, do all of that stuff. So hopefully that gets you going. If, if not, or if you have more questions about it, you know, drop me an email or shoot me something in the comments and we can chat about it. Um, I've actually had a pretty good response to this article and had some folks contact me and, and we've chatted about different ways to, to run uh, Phoenix web apps on OpenBSD. I think this one talks about, yeah, running it behind RelayD and letting RelayD do the um, SSL termination or TLS termination. I do recommend that you can terminate TLS with Cowboy. Um, and I even had worked out a way to use Acme with it. Um, I, I want to say I ran into some trouble with that, like something changed between two versions or 
There was something fiddly I want to say I ran into. I'm racking my brain right now. Oh, you know what it was? Is it had to do... There was something with... Oh no, that was something else. I did run into an interesting bug in Cowboy once. I think it's a bug in Cowboy. No, it's not. I don't think it is. Uh, I think it was actually a weird interaction between um, Erlang and the operating system. Something to do with... <sighs> oh, I don't know. I'd be telling you the wrong thing if I just said whatever the first thing is that come to my mind right now, but... Anyway, that yeah, that didn't have anything to do with TLS, but... I ran into something, and maybe it was just... Um, not wanting to use um, a bunch of IP addresses or something. Um, but anyway, yeah, RelayD seems to work great to run a Phoenix web app behind to do DLS termination, and it, it works pretty good with um, Acme Client. I think that's what, yeah, Acme Client. And anyway, this, this all works pretty well, I think. Um, now, if you're not, if you don't want to use RelayD, you want to have one less moving part, you, you totally can, as far as I know, um, have Cowboy do the TLS termination. Like I say, there's something in the back of my head. I might have run into something, but I don't think it was a showstopper. It might have just been something where I'm like, ah, I'm not going to mess with that, you know? Um, so you can explore that if you want, and I think you'll be okay. Um, but if you're going to run a bunch of apps, and especially if you're going to run a bunch of apps on one IP address, RelayD is a, a good option if you're on OpenBSD. So, yeah, that's our thing. It'll be live by now. I'll probably have moved it live before you see this video. Um, of course, I, I record the videos, and then I got to edit them, upload them. It takes YouTube a long time to process them, actually, and it takes me a long time to upload them. I'm, I'm a little bit out in the sticks here. I don't have super fast upload speed, um, but because they're all in 4K, and so the files are big, and it takes YouTube a while to, to do what it does with them. So... Um, yeah, I think this is video episode 21, and I think what's live right now is is like eight. So, yeah, unfortunately, it's it just runs a little behind, and um, so by the time you see this, this should be live, and maybe even with some updates on it and new things going on. But um, do you know? Please, if you will, check it out at lofi.limo. If if you know somebody who listens to um, music while they work or study, or if you do, you know put them on to it if you don't mind. Um, and for sure, like if you have any thoughts, questions, comments, anything I can do to make it better or just ideas you have, feel free to shoot me an email, um, support at parksdigital.com. Um, I really like talking to people, whether it's in the comments or by email. Um, it's a big part of what I get out of doing these videos, writing articles and um, sharing what I'm working on with other folks. Um, and it's really important to me too, um, to get that feedback, to be able to build a better product. Um, you know, it's just me sitting here in an office and I can dream up what people might like, but that's, um, <clears throat> it's never what you think. It's never what I think anyway, uh, what's important to folks. And so to actually get that feedback and really learn something is hugely valuable to me. And if it's something that you're willing to share, um, it means a lot to me to to have you share that with me and and I understand the time and the effort it takes to, to give that feedback um, you know I've been on the other side of the desk too and um, you know not for nothing to sit down and organize your thoughts and, and send them so I really do appreciate that um, and I appreciate you for hanging out with me and for writing some code and I don't think this will be the last video it'll probably be the last video in this series um, I think we have <clears throat> built technically a streaming music service in Phoenix and Elixir. Um, so, you know, I hope to do some more videos, but I'll probably do, you know, one-off or a short series um, of those specific things. Like I said, some things on my mind are analytics. Um, I definitely want to um, get the submission mechanism working again. I've had that in previous prototypes, and that's been very helpful and important in helping me connect with artists who are interested in having their um, songs and backgrounds on the platform, on the service. 
um, and to help engage with those folks and give them an easy way to reach out. Um, email is one thing, but if you can just um, poke into a forum, I, I know a lot of folks are more comfortable with that. And it helps get the conversation started. So I want to get that back in. Um, like I said, a few times we've got to do something for mobile. And um, boy, what else? There's, there's probably a lot more um, that we'll want to do. So, um, and maybe some of those things will be ideas that you share with me. So um, again, thanks a lot. And um, we'll see you, see you with whatever comes up next. Take care.